Welcome to Unlocking Science. Our goal is to glorify God by studying and unlocking the secrets of His amazing creation. I'm your host, Mr. P, and I'm joined today by Dr. David Menton. He's going to teach us about a subject that you might have to listen carefully to understand about. I think I might just give away the <laughs> you topic. You gave it away, though. right? I did. So we're going to be talking about the ear today, and not just this big fleshy structure on the outside of your head, but what's happening inside this bony structure inside of your skull, all the bones and the nerves and all the different tissues that are associated with that. And Dr. Menton is just the guy to teach us about that because he's been training people to understand these things, medical professionals and others for decades throughout his career. And then in his videos and workshops that he does here at the Creation Museum and associated with Answers in Genesis. So you go ahead and jump right into what you've got to teach us about the ear today. Okay, well, let's uh, begin by giving God uh, all the glory for the ear. The ear is an amazing, amazing structure. The Bible doesn't talk about everything. After all, it's not a book of biology. Uh, but the Lord doesn't want us to be confused, certainly, about the eye and the ear. Many places in Scripture, he mentions them. And I think a lot of people look to the eye or the ear as probably one of the supreme examples of God's creative work. Uh, I think uh, one of the more interesting verses dealing with our ear and our eye is to be found in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 12. Here we read, The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord, that's all in capital letters, so the great Jehovah God, the Lord has made them both. Now, uh, I know a lot of people, I've worked with a lot of people who wouldn't accept that statement. Uh, they would find it very frightening to believe such a thing. And that's uh, uh, understandable in a way because uh, if we're accountable to a creator, uh, and this creator demands perfection, doesn't he? He says, you shall be perfect, or you shall be holy, one way or the other. Mm -hmm. You shall be perfect for I the, as I, the Lord thy God, am perfect. I don't know how you're doing on a perfection scale, Mr. P, but I I'm not I've, doing I've well. I think I've missed a few. I'm sure I've, I've sinned and fallen short of that mark. Absolutely. And no wonder people would run away from a hearing and seeing God that demands perfection. And how well would this hearing and seeing God hear and see? You know, the Bible asks that very question in Psalm 94, verse 9, where it says, He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? And he that formed the eye, shall he not see? How well do you figure the creator of the ear would hear? He would hear our thoughts. And how well would the creator of the eye see? He could look right into our hearts and what would he hear and see there? This is a God who demands perfection. Mm -hmm. So no wonder people are frightened and run away from it, but it's so tragic because if they read their scriptures carefully and they can read this in the Old or New Testament almost everywhere you look, he's not just our creator. He's our savior too, and that changes everything. That takes away the otherwise completely justifiable fear uh, of uh, uh, a creator God that demands perfection and has ears that hear our thoughts and eyes that see into our hearts. Mm -hmm. So thanks to God's redemptive work, Christ paying the bills that we couldn't pay, giving the perfection that God demands in our stead, we call it justification. I like to pronounce it just as if I cation, <laughs> just as if I were perfect. And when we know that, it's great to have a hearing and seeing God. Here in Psalm 34, verse 15, we read that the eyes of the Lord, again, all capital letters, this is a great Jehovah God. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, that is, those made righteous in Christ, and his ears are open unto their cry. So great to have a hearing and seeing God. And Great to have eyes that can see and ears that can hear, because yeah. not everybody does. <laughs> that reminds me of the passage in 1 John that talks about if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, giving us that righteousness of Christ. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. very important concepts that are linked directly to the, the ear and the eye here in Scripture. Well, let's look at a model of what we're going to be looking at uh, in photographs in a bit here, but I think the model will give us... Uh, a little bit of a three-dimensional understanding. We have it here. Uh, first thing I want to point out is this model is three times bigger than it ought to be, okay? It's three times life size. So everything I show you, have to imagine three times bigger. Uh, you recognize uh, the ear here, but it gets confusing if we call this the ear because this whole business I'm going to show you is considered ear. Uh, three parts of it, in fact. 
So uh, maybe we should come up with a different name here. One of the names for this structure is the oracle. It works like a cup. It kind of catches the sound and it helps us to tell whether sound is coming from the front of us or the back of us. So already just the shape of this ear uh, is contributing to our ability uh, to hear. And this bone that you're looking at here, uh, this of course is not bone, but it represents bone, is the hardest bone in the body. It's so hard, it's been given a special name, Petrus bone. And you recognize Petrus bone from several places. One, petrified wood. Sure, <laughs> think of that petrified means it's been turned into stone, it's very hard. Mm -hmm. And then there's an apostle that goes by that name. <laughs> Peter, whose name means stone or rock. Right, mm -hmm. means rock. So, uh, I'm pretty sure the reason this bone is so dense compared to other bones is uh, for acoustic reasons, because of the hearing that goes on inside of the skull. If we look at the back side, you might not think there'd be anything of interest back here, but there's one thing that is, and that's this uh, little bump you see here. Uh, to get an idea where we're at here, if you feel with your finger behind your ear, there is a bony bump right here. It's called a mastoid process. It's a place where a muscle goes from that bump down to your sternum. We call it the sternocleidomastoid. That's named after all the structures all the that it touches, that connects, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the muscle you used when you were born and you started to raise your head. That muscle goes from here to here, goes across this teeter-totter joint on your head, and you used it to raise your head. And at first that bump wasn't there. That bump develops in association with the pulling of the muscle tendon of that sternocleidomastoid. So our bones are dynamic. They can actually change mass and shape to increase their strength to keep a tendon from being pulled yeah, out so of the joint. So where that tendon's attached, it feels that, it senses that, and your body's response Absolutely. by creating that bump and making it larger. Mm -hmm. So a newborn baby wouldn't have that bump at all. But it gives you an idea. We're working straight in from there is where a lot of interesting things are going to happen. And we'll pull the parts off this model now. Get this door open. Get that open, and we can see that there are three basic parts to the ear. There's this opening, external auditory canal. I call it the hole on the side of the head, if you don't want to think <laughs> about that. And right away, we know there's a crater because the diameter of this canal and its length is tuned like an organ pipe to be optimized to the frequency of speech, about six kilohertz. Uh, then uh, we call that the outer ear. And then here we get to the middle part. Would you care to guess what we call this part? It's called the middle ear. That's quite a coincidence. I'm not going too fast for my I think we're getting <laughs> so, there. Okay. This is called the middle ear. And there are little bones in there, okay? Tiny little bones, smallest bones in the body. We'll show you those bones. And then uh, finally, we get to the inner ear, but you can't see it. We have to remove some more bone to get to the inner ear. And that's this interesting looking structure right here. And if we can set this down now, mm -hmm. part of it looks like a snail, doesn't it? And uh, it's called the snail in Latin. In Latin cochlea, cochlea means the mm -hmm. snail. And that's exactly what it looks like. And like a snail shell, it's, it's hollow. And then uh, this part in the middle is called the vestibule. And then these little canals, notice they're half a circle. They're called the half a circle canal. <laughs> Actually, it's a semi-circular. Semi but same <laughs> thing, yep. right? Half a circle. Mm -hmm. And uh, these canals are oriented, this would be my left ear, so over here, about one third this size, okay? And this part is for hearing. The cochlea. The vestibule in the middle, among other things, gives you your sense of being right side up or upside down, has a little mm -hmm. sensing mechanism. And these little canals are interesting. At the end of each canal, there's a bulge. It's called a bulge. <laughs> Only Latin, ampulla. And inside that little bulge, we have one for each of the semicircular canals. Here's a bulge here. There's a valve that moves. And all of this is filled with liquid. It's hollow. It's made out of bone, a little different type of bone than the bone we removed it from, so you can actually dissect this out. And uh, one of these canals is in this axis in our body, one is in this axis, and one's in that axis. And so when we move in this axis, the liquid, the inertia of the liquid here, like if I took a glass of water and went real quick like that, 
some of the water might go over the top. Mm -hmm. Inertia can't move as fast as a glass. So when we move like this, the liquid moves this little valve, and your brain says, why are you doing that? <laughs> Something like that. Anyway. Yes. And then this one goes to the side. That one determines when we're moving like this. And then this one, parallel, that determines when we're doing this. And so these are the three possible movements we can make in space. These are the three things you can do with an airplane. <laughs> Up, down, left, right, lean this way, Roll, lean that yeah. way. So these are all of the different aspects of balance that, that we would use. Now, That's if right. there were any types of disorders in here, or if, these, if the valves get stuck, or there are other, the liquid is evacuated from it through some accident or types of things, then you would actually lose your sense of balance. So your ears are right. very tightly tied to that sense of balance. Or even if you did this and you're not used to it, uh, you uh, go up and you jump off one of these cliff divers, you know, they go off the cliff, Flip and on the way times. down, this is what you're doing. <laughs> That probably would confuse your brain because oh you're not goodness. used to processing that data. So oh, quickly. I get dizzy when I see people with wavy hair. I couldn't handle this. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, isn't it amazing? Some people overcome ice skaters. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just can't fall down after they do a spin. They must yeah. learn how to kind of deal with this. Their brain but, has a coping mechanism to deal with all of those things. Mm -hmm. So when you're, you know, you're spinning like this, uh, these canals are say <clears throat> you're here. No, you're there. No, you're really here. No, you're here. All that signal is coming in. So uh, normally we don't get confused by it because we don't make those radical moves. And then coming in the side here is a little bone shaped like a stirrup. And that's one of the three small bones in what we call the middle ear. Right there, it fits into an oval window that's been cleverly called the oval window. And when these little bones move, that works like a piston in and out, changing the pressure inside the cochlea. So let's uh, put this all back together here. And then this is the big nerve that's coming from our brain, one of the spinal nerves. And uh, it's the eighth column out of the 12. It's the uh, uh, auditory, auditory nerve. Mm -hmm. and vestibular nerve coming in here. And so all of that sets encased in this very dense bone. And so this structure is itself bone and hollow. This is bone, but the two have a different texture. You can actually dissect this out. Yeah. I actually did that in college. I dissected a shark, so it was cartilage, of course, but I was able to isolate these bones and be able to remove them. So mm -hmm. definitely, I've never done it in a human, but in a shark before. There's another thing we can see in the model that we ought to point out. Look at this big mm -hmm. tube here, coming down here. This is called the Eustachian tube. You've probably heard of it. Sometimes you fly in airplanes and you can start to feel a pressure build in your ears. And what do you do to get it to pop and open up? chew gum or yawn move your jaw up and down and the reason that helps there's a muscle associated with your jaw that attaches to this tube pulls it makes a little kink in it because what's causing that blockage is a little mucus or something that builds up in here and so we have air pressure out here then we have the eardrum right here and we have air pressure over here and ideally you want the pressure here and here to be the same if the pressure out here is higher or lower, this eardrum is going to behave like a barometer. You've talked about yes. this in some of your classes. Mm -hmm. Only instead of giving us interesting information, it just gives us a lot of pain. Yes, very uncomfortable. So this opens up into what we call our nasopharynx, the nasal area mm -hmm. inside the body. And it allows the air that's uh, on this side of the eardrum to be equalized with the air on the other. Anything that would block this will start making this behave like a barometer. Yeah, so we can bring air in through our mouth and balance out that pressure with the air outside right. and get it to pass into the tube here and balance that pressure. Mm -hmm. So now that you've got the layout, the lay of the land, uh, let's kind of look at what's going on here. Uh, here are our three parts of the ear right away. Outer, get the pointer here. The outer ear, middle ear, and inner ear. And uh, we'll bring them up in order. There's the outer ear, and we hear in air. Have you noticed that? We live in air. It's a good thing we can hear in air. Sometime you'll have to do this experiment for one of your physics classes where you take an alarm clock, set it to ring at a certain time, mm -hmm. one of the old hammer type on yes. the bell. And if you have it in a chamber that the vacu that a vac has a, a vacuum, vacuum chamber, yeah, you will hardly be able to hear it because sound is conducted through air. Uh, differences in air pressure, uh, little pulses or waves. You probably wonder when somebody talks to you, is something flying from their mouth 
I don't happen to, to your see ear. anything coming <laughs> there. Or even from a speaker that we're hearing sound. That's right, through. same thing from mm -hmm. a speaker. Whether it's your vocal cords doing this, or a speaker going like that, mm -hmm. we're getting a little more compressed air, less compressed air, more compressed, less compressed, and it's energy. It's sort of like lining up a bunch of marbles on a table, touching one another, and take a shooter and hit the one on the end. The energy will go from marble to marble, and the last one in a row will take off and roll. So it's really energy through compressing air and less compressed. You know, we go up in a mountain, the air gets less dense and it's hard to breathe. How high a mountain would we have to climb in order to uh, appreciate the difference uh, in air pressure our ear can hear up to 20,000 times a second, at least when we're young? I bet it's not very far. No, it would be a 30 thousandths of an inch tall mountain. That so would that'd be, be like standing on a piece of cardboard. <laughs> yeah, like from the back of a tablet, back of not a tablet. even yeah, corrugated, just thin. Just thin mm -hmm. Yeah. Imagine that difference in altitude your eardrum is responding to thousands of times a second. It's amazingly sensitive. Hey, how's dumb luck working for you so far? And we're just getting started. We're just getting started here. So uh, we live in air, we hear in air, and the outer ear handles air. We get to the middle ear, and all of a sudden the sound, after it hits the eardrum, is transmitted through bone. You probably don't think of sound going through bone, but bone does conduct sound. And uh, these little bones uh, kind of wiggle. And this one is shaped like a stirrup. It's called a stirrup, or in Latin, stapes. It fits into a little oval-shaped window called the oval window. And when these little bones wiggle, uh, this little stirrup kind of pushes in and out of this oval window. And that causes the pressure of the liquid inside this uh, cochlea to kind of move around and change in pressure. So sound is conducted through air here and bone here. A good part of our hearing, uh, when we speak ourselves, our own voice, is sound coming through bone. There's a little experiment maybe some of our young people would like to try. Yeah. Uh, not too difficult to get the equipment together for this one. Get a spoon. The heavier the spoon, the better. It gives you a nice sound. Tie a string onto it so that you have two roughly equal pieces of string that go down to the spoon. Now this part's a tricky part. You get the string over your thumbs like that, and you push it so that you plug your ear and push the string against your skull at the same time. Now do this. Oh my goodness, that was Big Ben in London. Then. That didn't sound very loud to me. <laughs> oh, you try this at home. It'll sound just like a big church bell to you because the vibration coming up the strings vibrating your skull mm -hmm. uh, is giving you all this sound. So the bones of our skull are part of our sound receiving mechanism. That's why when you somebody get recorded, like we're being recorded now, when we play it back, it doesn't sound like, you think it sounds like it, me. It, I think it sounds like you, but you and vice versa. I don't think it sounds like me on that recording. I hear my dad a lot when I hear me talking right. in a recording. I think, what's my dad doing? And it's actually me. Yeah, I assumed <laughs> I had a great tenor voice like the uh, Pavarotti, the great mm -hmm. singer. But the, the voice I hear uh, through the recording is some pipsqueak of something. <laughs> So we anyway, want to, want to take a look at these little bone. bones here. We can yeah, let's them. take a look at these. So are we'll the bring real the bones. camera in here close. These are the actual bones out of the inner ear, and middle ear, or middle ear. I'm sorry, middle ear, and these are the incus and the malles and then the stapes, the stirrup down here. So those are the Latin names. They basically mean malles means the hammer. Mallet is a word we get out of malleus in Latin. And then the anvil over here, the incus, and then stapes down at the bottom, that means stirrup. So those, that is the actual size of those bones sitting next to my finger, you can see there. People wonder, well, why do we have those little bones in our ear? The air uh, is conducting sound, just leave it in the air. Well, we've got a problem and that comes up next. We just went through the middle ear, we'll come back to it. Uh, here's the inner ear and there we hear through liquid. It's called endolymph. It's sort of like uh, cerebral spinal fluid uh, or extracellular fluid. And so it contains certain salts and has a certain pH. You see, inside that cochlea, that snail shell, there are special cells called hair cells that do the hearing for us, or at least get the original signal started. And uh, these little hairs get wiggled. That generates electric current that goes to the brain that the brain interprets as sound. 
So you think, well, why not just have these little hair cells out here in the air? Well, they would die. They would dry out and die, just like you buy uh, meat uh, from the meat market. Mm -hmm. If you leave it out, it'll just dry up and be no good. So uh, we need to keep them in a certain pH, certain temperature, certain chemical balance. Otherwise, they're not happy and they don't work. So going from air to liquid is what we call an impedance mismatch. You can see it when you, uh, or hear it when you're in water at the swimming pool. When you go underwater, somebody yells from on top, you can't hear it. And it sounds all garbled and you might hear a little bit of subtle sound, but you can't get a clear message right. out of that. 99.9% .9 of the sound energy reflects off the water, a tenth of 1% goes in, and that's what you'd get without those little bones in the middle ear. So start appreciating what they do for us. Uh, and then the important part of getting the signal that's going to go to the brain will come from this snail shell or cochlea. So uh, let's start here. Uh, we talked about the outer ear. It's tuned like an organ pipe. Uh, here's the middle ear with those little bones. Uh, we looked at those uh, and when the eardrum wiggles, it really amplifies the movement through these bones. These are actually lubricated joint, one here and one down here. Uh, that makes this piston-like foot plate go in and out, uh, compressing the liquid in the cochlea. Yeah, and that foot of the malleus is actually connected right to the back side of the what we think of as the eardrum, that membrane there, and causes it to move back and forth. Right, mm -hmm. so when the eardrum wiggles here, uh, it wiggles this handle, and it doesn't have to wiggle much, as we'll see. <laughs> uh, there's what it looks like, kind of magnified a bit. And uh, some amazing facts about these little bones are as follows. That stapes shown in green now, the uh, stirrup, that really does look like a stirrup with a foot plate. It's three-tenths of an inch long and weighs one ten-thousandths of an ounce. That is comfortably the smallest bone in our body. Other, another interesting fact is these are the only bones in the body that don't grow after you're born. So the size that you saw in the, in the little uh, mount here, that's the size they've been since the day you're born. Uh, they're also solid all the way through, and uh, they have no marrow in them. Presumably that's important for acoustic reasons. And how about this for an amazing fact? At 4 kilohertz, that's 4,000 cycles per second, that's about in the middle of the range of human speech. Our eardrum is said to respond to movements in the range of one-tenth the diameter of a hydrogen atom. <laughs> now that's not even the most amazing thing. The most amazing thing is our eardrum is skin, has blood vessels in it, red blood cells are going through those vessels. How big is a red blood cell compared to a hydrogen atom? Oh, that's got to be millions of times bigger. I mean six microns across for the red mm -hmm. blood cell and when you get to the hydrogen atom we're talking... Uh, in we use angstroms as a unit to measure things that small. It's and that's the distance small. between. It's not the diameter yeah. of, the, of the hydrogen atom itself. It's the distance between the electrons and the mm -hmm. neutrons and what have you. We could never resolve the individual atom itself. So uh, one-tenth the diameter of a hydrogen atom, uh, absolutely amazing. Why don't we hear the blood? That's a great question. You should just hear it rushing through that eardrum all It the ought time. to be the loudest thing you hear drive you insane. How much would you pay just to have that noise taken away? Well, I can imagine people who have that condition we call tinnitus, who have that constant ringing in their ears, could answer that question. That would be this on, I mean, this would be that on hormones. Yes. I mean, it's really huge problem. So there's some noise cancellation going in there that's just absolutely amazing, and I thank the Lord for it. Well, let's uh, look at the inner ear, getting here to the Inner part, that's this one here. We pulled it out before, remember? Look like this. Only this is three times life size again. It should be one third that size. And uh, what is this doing for us? Oh my goodness, wait till you see all the things uh, this can do. If we magnify it a bit here, here it is. Uh, it shows its oval window, you recall? That's where the foot plate of the stirrup fits in there. This is like a speaker uh, on a radio or TV mm -hmm. or something. At the edge of the cone, there's like a little rubber thing called a surround that seals it off so the air doesn't leak through. You have the same thing here. This little piston goes in and out, but you can't allow the liquid to come out. So it's got a surround just like on a speaker <laughs> going around the edge. 
Now, if you have something that's full of liquid, you really couldn't push that foot plate in and out. For example, take a bottle of water, like these plastic mm -hmm. bottles we get now with bottled water. Fill it to the top. Now take a cork and try to push it in. And then try to squeeze the bottle. Yeah, You'd right. have to be pretty strong to get any pressure. That's right. It. So uh, water is incompressible, basically, for all practical purposes. Mm -hmm. So the only way that that piston could go in from those little three bones, the foot plate, go in and out, is to relieve the pressure. And down here we have a little round window. Would you care to take a stab at the name of that? Well, if the oval window is called the oval window, I'm going to guess this one's called the round window. Right. It's the round window. And it has something rather like a little rubber diaphragm or something that covers it. So when the piston goes in, that pouches out. Mm -hmm. When the piston comes out, that goes in. And so inside this cochlea, which is all hollow, as any good snail shell should be when a snail's not in there, uh, this liquid is doing this. Goes this way, this way, this way, back and forth. And that is part of the signal that is going to wiggle those little hairs on the hair cell. Mm -hmm. And that's going to generate electricity that will go to the brain. So when you push in there, the pressure comes out down there. And this is happening thousands of times a second for the frequency that we can hear at high frequency. We can hear 20,000 when you're young, 20,000 per second. 20,000 times per second, that's moving in and out, and yeah. we're able to detect that. And this is what it looks like inside the snail shell. Instead of just one open channel, there's three channels, as you can see here. I won't get into the names, you get a little technical here. But there's an upper channel, a middle one, and a lower one. All three have liquid in them. And then uh, right here is a little structure. It wins one of my prizes for the most amazing organ in the body. There are about four or five that I put in that category the eye, the brain, the placenta, and this one, the organ of Corti, named after a man named Corti. And it's not one little piece here. Think continuously. This is a strip that goes around continuous all the way up to the top. Now, what's happening here? When the foot plate of the stirrup goes in, the pressure is higher in the upper chamber. That pressure goes round and round and goes through a hole up here called a helicotrema and then comes back down during the lower channel. So if we illustrate that, we can kind of show you with arrows what's going on there. Pressure goes in there, round up to the top, and then comes back down to the bottom. And so uh, this is oval window side, that's round window side. Now what is that doing? One millisecond, the pressure is higher here, then it's here, then it's here, then it's here, then, boy, right in the middle, that's going for quite a ride. It's going to be riding the waves almost. <laughs> in very tiny dimensions, but that organ of Corti bounces up and down like a ship riding on waves due to the pressure changing top and bottom. And it's the organ of Corti going up and down that's going to generate electrical current. And you're probably wondering, well, how does that work? And I'm glad you asked. Because we're going to look at just one turn. And here it is at higher power. There's the organ of Corti. Remember, it's not just one little piece, it's a strip. This drawing should have shown it going back straight like that, but I'll have to redo it. And when that goes up and down, that mechanical movement gets converted to electricity. How does it do that? Well, let's magnify the organ of Corti. Here's an actual photograph that I took of the organ of Corti. Remember, this thing is a long strip spiraling around. We just hit one section, like cutting through a belt. You just get one cross section. And this is the upper chamber we were talking about up here. This is the lower chamber, and this is this triangular middle chamber. And when this goes up and down, there's something here called a tectorial membrane. Again, think in 3D. This is not one little piece like a thumb. It's a strip spiraling around. These are the hair cells. There's three rows of outer hair cells and one row of inner hair cells. And they're little hairs that are too tiny to see in the microscope. You need an electron microscope to see them. Those little hairs come up and stick into this tectorial membrane, which is kind of gelatinous. Now, the way it all works is this. Let's uh, uh, pump it up to another level of power. <laughs> this is an illustration. There's a tectorial membrane. Here's our three outer hair cells in our row of inner hair cells, and these are the little hairs up here sticking into the tectorial membrane. Look at it this way, as though this was the organ of Cordy, my arm, 
and the hairs are sticking up from my hand. My hand would be what you see in green there, this, this part. The hairs would be sticking up through, and then the pink, the tectile membrane, that would be like my other hand over the top. So the hairs would be sticking into my hand. Does that make sense so far? Okay, now we're going to make it go up and down, and because of the way the system's hinged, look what happens. Your hand is sliding back and forth across the other one as it moves. Because of the fixed hinge mm -hmm. in the system. So as the organ of Cordy rides up and down on the waves, <laughs> the hairs get bent. Well, what does bending the hair have to do with anything? Oh my goodness, hair is going to get complicated. We're not going to go too far into this. Our brain could just pop open like a <laughs> rotten pumpkin if we got too far into this. But uh, let's just look at the hairs there. Here they are in a scanning electron microscope. We're on the top. We've taken the tectorial membrane away. Okay, pulled that away so we can see the hairs coming up. And here they are sticking up through the surface. The cell is below this. This is the three of the outer row hair cells. This is the row of inner there. And notice the hairs are all different lengths uh, in these hairs. Here it is in higher power in the outer hair cells. You have long ones, middle size, shorter ones. Kind of looks like people standing on a choir bench. You That's right, that or there. organ pipes no, uh, organ in an pipes. organ. Mm -hmm. And there's a good reason they're this way. That's just not that way for looks, okay? Remember, that's stuck into the uh, tectorial membrane as it goes up and down. That causes the hairs to bend. What does bending the hairs have to do with anything here? On the tip of each of these little hairs, which are way too small to see at the highest power of a light microscope, you need an electron microscope mm -hmm. to see these hairs. On the tip of each hair is a hole. And this hole is an ion channel that electrically charged ions, like sodium ions, can go through. And what does that have to do with anything? Well, look at the model here. Here's a short hair, this is a long hair. So two hairs together, one's longer than the other, as you know they are. On the end is a trap door that covers the hole. It's a molecular trap door. And the molecular trap door, as you see in a higher magnification, is attached to a molecular spring that attaches to the next longest hair. Now when these hairs get bent, I'm gonna, these are the long ones, these are the short ones, got the picture here? Watch what happens as they bend. Again, you've got motion happening between It's the almost two hairs. as if one set of fingers are getting shorter than mm -hmm. the other. So if we have a spring attached to a longer finger, coming down to a trap door on the lower finger, when it bends, it's pulling the door open. Ion goes through that. <laughs> when it goes forward, the door is closed up to 20,000 times a second. That's amazing. For the highest frequency note you can hear. I don't know about you, but I think this is so complicated that uh, I, I think we should stop it here. My brain's starting to hurt. <laughs> and all of that feeds back to the nerves that are tiny little nerve fibers Going to the that brain. then feed back to the auditory nerve and then feed back to the brain. And God has programmed our bodies. He's created us to be able to understand those things. And that's an important concept because one of the first things we do, we see in Genesis is God communicating to Adam and Eve, his creatures. He's giving them commands and directions and expecting communication back. And in fact, that gives us the opportunity to not only hear about the bad news that there's sin in our hearts that corrupt us, but that there's good news that Christ has came has come as the Savior and the Redeemer, and that it's by the preaching and proclamation of that word and the hearing that we can receive those things. So it's a huge blessing that God has given us that opportunity to not only recognize our sin, but to respond to the Savior. And what is the great name of that Savior? In the beginning was the Word. Word, word spelled with a capital W. That's Christ himself, his Word which we can hear as a word, we can read as a word, but uh, that's as close as we can get to our Heavenly Father is through Christ. Mm. All right, we hope you've gotten a little bit of a peek into what all goes on inside of your ear just to hear the sounds that are coming to you right now. It's an amazingly complex organ and it's something that God has given us. We recognize this as one of the hallmarks of his design as the creator of everything. And we wanna give him praise and glory for the way he's made us. So until we see you next time, get out and explore all of God's amazing creation.